first and in other words, is most likely to need or may already need renal care, um, less likely to need or um, less prone to cancer, and has no problem with mental services. And the other people have similar outcome differences and preferences. <coughs> and when we put the Porter set paradox, we get exactly the same circularity. I thought Richard concludes that in allocating those resources, there is no social optima. We have actually used this term very loosely, and yet when we contextualize it, it's pretty obvious it doesn't exist. Now, the reason for the paradox is that it isn't a paradox. It's just that human beings are not very good at abstract thinking. Um, as soon as we get into any level of complexity, our intuition breaks down, and we fear it's a paradox because we have this deeply intuitive feeling that our intuitions ought to be correct. Um, and they're often not so. Um, as the complexity rises, our intuitions break down. But when one criteria, the simplest of all situations, the concept of transitivity is perfectly okay. So, for example, we try to maximize income, and that's the only criteria. Um, yes, A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, and A is going to be greater than C. Unambiguous ranking is possible. As soon as we move to two criteria, just that one simple move, it ceases to be possible. Uh, it may coincidentally be transitive, but there is always the possibility of a clash unless um, uh, the two criteria are absolutely identical. So, for example, in the case of Arrow, or rather Porter said, um, majority voting is one criteria, and transitivity is another criteria. Sen made a splash where he said that somebody fulfilling the Pareto criterion um, may not fulfill the principles of liberalism. Well, two criteria is possible that they clash, but most unsurprising. <coughs> um, if you're ranking food according to how healthy, tasty, and cheap it is, you may just find that it's not transitive. If you vote between healthy and tasty, and tasty and cheap, and cheap and healthy, uh, you'll find that there is no social problem. It's a Sunday school effect that we'd like the world to be simple and easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, government, we like it to be intelligent, moral, and courageous. We all know that these things uh, don't necessarily come together, and it's just possible from time to time that they flourish. So the basic logic behind this is trivial. Uh, we've, however, abstracted it, put it into mathematics, and convinced ourselves that this is a profoundly intellectual problem in which we have a whole school of thought. In the real world, moving to health, we have an innumerable number of criteria. We've simplified it down to um, cost for quality, but in fact it's far more than that. So the conclusion is that multiple criteria means that the social optimum potentially does not exist, and in general in any complex situation does not will not exist. Um, social value is simply a vague term. It's like beauty or justice for some. It's not precisely defined. Uh, that, on the other hand, doesn't mean that it's meaningless. Uh, we can make statements that this is beautiful, this is unjust, and people know in general terms what you mean, and you can have a very useful conversation that way. Um, in fact, in science, most of the basic terms are vague. They get their precision when we quantify them. The actual underlying concepts, we don't have a deeply precise concept of what a human is. Meteorologists get precision by measuring the speed, not by trying to get a clear concept of the idea of a wind. So social value doesn't have a precise definition, but isn't a correct social optimum, but it's a term, it's a label we use to flag the fact that we're talking about something which is potentially broader than simple individual values. So the relevance to health is the criteria of cost for quality. Yes, that's nice and simple because we've thrown away everything else. As soon as we get two or more criteria, the cost for quality plus, for example, a distributive criteria and perhaps procedural fairness, just to name two of an innumerable number, unambiguous ranking is simply not possible. So 
Uh, what do we do? Well, just very briefly, we can turn to ethics as a solution. I hope John's not here. No, he's not. Um, it's actually, I call it a straw ethics because it's not all of ethics, it's just something that might go under the head. Uh, when we say that a principle ought to be adopted because, and then we'll give the reasons for utilitarianism or the reasons for capabilities, um, Rule X ought to be followed because, and we use logic to try and draw a conclusion. Um, what's wrong with that approach has been known for a long, long time, um, in fact, for 2,500 years, when Plato quite remarkably knocked down his own system um, using this logic. If we have judgment based upon your pure logic, we require a criterion. Um, utilitarianism is better because judged by criterion X. But why did we choose criterion X rather than criterion Y? We have to judge between criterion X and criterion Y, which means we'll need a meta criterion to choose between them. So as I say here, oh dear, what can the meta be? Um, we have an infinite regress here. And you simply can't use pure logic to draw the final conclusion. And because the criteria simply keep going back. So, um, forget pure um, logic and just to put the final nail in the coffin, uh, Hume, of quantity the theory of money pain, um, pointed out uh, what is pretty widely known is that you cannot go from his um, empirical uh, statements to an ordered an ethical statement as we want to get when we're talking about a social. So philosophy is pretty good at showing a logical error. It's for a probing with different ideas, but it's not going to give us solutions by itself. So, if the task of getting a social optimum is impossible, we have to redefine the task. So, um, what's going on? A little bit more theory before I um, go about uh, redefining it. The progress today is today is just that we talk about a social welfare function and then try to avoid the fact that no such thing exists. We give a mathematical form, we make it sound as if we've got progress. Um, it's not, it's, it's a, it's a cover-up, smoke screen. Potential greater improvement is based upon a lack of logic. Um, ethics can't lead us anywhere. Um, arrows um, nail in the coffin shows that rational choice is impossible. Um, we treat that as deeply profound in the end. Choice is commonplace. Choice is possible, despite this paradox telling us that it isn't, um, at least not rationally. Um, so, the question is, why are we in this position? And here I'll get into, um, if you can tune out if you like, for a minute or two. Um, the way I think it's easiest to think about what's going on here is to turn to Karl Popper's uh, metaphysical schema. And more for convenience than talking about um, real entities, uh, he talks about three separate worlds which classify um, different entities uh, which have different characteristics. There's the subjective experience world, which we all feel. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, world 2 is what would commonly be called the real world. Uh, the physical world, sort of out there, which we experience. Uh, in that, there are specific objects and events, people, institutions, and rigidities. It's characterized by complexity, the best guesses about what's going on, historical behaviors, institutional behaviors, incremental change, and compromise. It's a mess. And we impose patterns on that. Um, we know that from Manuel Kant onwards. That gives us world three, which is the world of theories, ideas, ideals, mathematics. We have created it mentally because we've imposed this on the world, but nevertheless, it operates by rules which make it independent of us. What you said about that mathematical system, you can't just say, well, two and two and two and two and seven because that's what I feel like. You set up rules and it becomes independent of you. And any number of examples, Plato's was the first great 
massive schema of a, a world tree, um, all the ideal worlds that have been put forward by mathematics itself, the various ethical theories, and welfare theory. Uh, we have made a series of assumptions, we've set up a schema. Um, it's characterized by simplicity, often by certainty, by ideal behaviors, best solutions, maxima, something we never observe in the real world, but fundamentally in economics, <coughs> maximizing behavior, because we have conceptualized this and we have created this. And the problem that we face throughout is connecting world 3 to world 2. Uh, the physical sciences have been remarkably successful. They do that by making highly unexpected predictions. Um, antimatter, the quantum mechanics and particle entanglement, which is that two particles can influence each other even though they're completely unconnected and there is nothing joining them and it's instantaneous. Um, black holes, and all of these uh, were predicted from world three. They were radically counterintuitive and nobody understands why particle entang um, uh, entanglement occurs. But empirically, it was uh, theoretically it was predicted, and empirically it occurred. And it occurs in world two. So we believe there is a strong connection between world three and world two. Welfare economics, I won't go through the rest of economics, it's, it's weak as well, but welfare economics simply has no predictable predictions. Um, in terms of our social behaviors, um, we haven't even got a concept of it. Even in terms of individual behaviors, we have definitions um, which make it untestable. Rather, we come from assumptions. Those assumptions are firmly rooted in World 3. They're oversimplified, generally, never proven, often wrong. So the connection between our World 2 and our World 3 is never satisfactory in welfare. So, alternative frameworks for analysis are leading into the policy equations. Um, first thing we could attempt to map World 3 to World 2, which is what we do at the moment. Um, we cover up by using mathematics and pretending that this somehow or other has got magical properties. It's a long history of treating mathematics as a test mystical powers. Um, but there are no tests to actually show we've made that transition. Um, we do know, following our own concept, that it's theoretically possible that we simply don't have conclusions. Um, it's possibly theoretically impossible <coughs> to this connection between social welfare um, in World 3 and World 2. Alternatively, uh, we can carry out positive analysis, not normative analysis, in which we say this is um, uh, what should be. Uh, we examine the relationships in the world too that are relevant uh, to, uh, uh, to, to decision making. So we're not actually advocating that this is best, this is an optimum, this is uh, the way things should be. We simply carry out positive studies, um, which we postulate would be relevant, others may not agree. That's positive analysis. And thirdly, we can actually suggest ethical theories that's normative. Uh, those normative suggestions have no authority, they're simply suggestions that we toss in. So, what does this mean for policy on the ground? Um, it has to be suggestions. There's no proof, there's no technical way of some normative, we only pretend that. Um, firstly, empirical ethics, uh, something that we do a lot of in a little group here. Positive analysis of welfare related questions. Um, all of the relationships that we talked about uh, in the previous seminar and will be in the previous lecture in Switzerland fall in this category, where we say one of people's social values with respect to age, with respect to severity, with respect to sharing. These aren't necessarily right 